morning, everyone. We're so glad to have you at the Fowler Avenue Baptist Church Sunday morning. And we're studying in 2 Peter. We'll get into that in just a few moments. Brother Steve's going to come on down and share with us some things that on the agenda. And we're so thankful for God's mercy and grace and provision that he gives us every day. You know, a lot of you have a lot on your plate right now. And many people do. And we have a missionary. It introduced him, Brother Quinn, going to the United Kingdom. So Steve will come at this time. Good morning. It's good to have everybody with you, with us this morning. And uh, we've got um, some good scenario, Brother Sam Quinn. Uh, he uh, lives in Georgia and headed to the United Kingdom. He's going to be sharing his testimony and also singing a special uh, for us this morning. Well, it is a wonderful privilege to be here with y'all this morning and to get a chance to be here uh, back here in Florida. We were here probably a month ago, and it's just kind of funny how you end up back in the same place over and over and over again. But then again, I do live in Georgia, so it's not that far away. But uh, yes, please pray for my wife. She has gallbladder surgery coming up on Friday, and that's the main reason she's not here. It's not that she's in pain or anything like that, but the doctor had to delay uh, if she traveled, and so we just figured... May as well get it done as soon as possible because we are trying to leave uh, in November. I'll tell you a little bit about that in just a second. But this is a song. I worked in Northern Ireland as a single missionary for three years. And this is a song that I learned there and really just grew to love it. testimony with y'all. I was saved uh, at the age of 14. I had grown up in a Christian home. My parents were actually missionaries when I was a kid, and I had gotten to, through most of my, uh, or at least like half of my teenage years, thinking I was going to be okay. And I was a good person. I went to church and things like that, but I was sitting in a, a Christian camp, and the Lord began to work in my heart, and the preacher got up, and he said something that I'll never forget. He said, if you were 99% sure that you are saved, you could be 100% lost. And I sat back and I thought about it and really measured in my head. And I said, Lord, I don't know for definite that if I died right now, I'd go to heaven. So I said, Lord, if I'm not saved, save me. The Lord changed my life that day. And uh, from the age of 14, I, I, the, I didn't really serve the Lord as much as I ought to. The problem with being saved at 14 years old is 14-year-olds have a tendency to be a little dim. A little, uh, well, lack of better words, it's stupid. And I had stupid friends, and they kind of kept me from serving God, and, and I kept myself from serving God. But the Lord continued to work in my heart and things like that. And I came to a point when I was 18 years old, I didn't know what to do. I didn't know where to go. I didn't know what God wanted from me, and I didn't understand what was going on in my life. And I, I sat down, and I began to read my Bible. And I found John 7, 18, which I've taken as a life verse of mine. It says, He that speaketh of himself seeketh his own glory. But he that seeketh the glory of him that sent him, the same is true, and no unrighteousness is in him. 
Now that little verse, what it told me as I read it is that if Sam Quinn is uh, caught up on his importance, on his ambition, on his way of doing things, on, on what I have in mind to do, then I missed, my, missed the point. Because it's all about him. And it's all about the Lord. And he is so great and wonderful and perfect and far beyond anything we'd ever possibly imagine that for me to consider anybody else but him to be the one that I follow is just awful. And I said, Lord, all right, God, I know that you want me to serve you. So I said, anywhere you want me to go, whatever you want me to do, that's what I'm going to do. And he opened up. He showed me the he called me to preach. And so I'm not a man of half ways. So I uh, got I surrendered, went to camp, but the Lord called me to preach. And the third week I was standing in uh, the admissions office for Tabernacle Baptist Bible College in Greenville, South Carolina. Like I said, I don't do anything half ways. On the other hand, Bible colleges do do things half ways, so I had to come back the next week because that was when open enrollment started. <laughs> so I went to Tabernacle, and the Lord worked to my heart there to get involved in missions. I was studying for one of my teacher's exams. Uh, Dr. Dan Truax was a great uh, missionary in Africa for many years, and he came back after getting sick with a determination of two things. One, that every preacher he met, he'd try and get him into missions. And secondly, every missionary he could get, he'd try and get him to go to Africa. He got me halfway. Well, his exams for his class were not easy, and they were not fun, but they were extraordinarily helpful. See, he, he had written his book, which was all about why we should be involved in missions, why the church should be involved in missions. And then as well, his other part of his exam was not only regurgitating his book, basically, but also memorize all the verses in scriptures about the missions. And then you have to write those out verbatim, which was just so much fun. I did horrible on his exams, but I studied all right. And so I studied and I was going through Ezekiel chapter 3. And uh, this was one of the verses we had today. It said in 318, when I say unto the wicked, thou shalt surely die. And thou givest him not warning, nor speakest to warn the wicked from his wicked way, to save his life. The same wicked shall die in his iniquity, but his blood will I require at thine hand. I sat there and I realized how extreme that is. God's using hard language. And I thought, well, missions is a good thing for everybody to be involved in. But what this is saying is that if there are people dying and going to hell, and I don't make it my first priority to tell them how they can be saved, I've missed it. Their blood is on my hands. And I have failed them and I have failed God. I said, God, if you take this, this seriously and this extreme, then Lord, help me, direct me, guide me. I surrender to be a missionary. And the Lord just began to work in my heart. And I can uh, continued on the way uh, to finish Bible college. Got towards the end of Bible college and had a great revelation. Now, this wasn't new revelation. Don't get confused. But it was this revelation that every man eventually needs to come to. And if he doesn't get there on his own, his wife surely helps him with it. I realized that I am an idiot. Now, that's an important thing to get a hold of. Because if you think you know what you're doing, you're doomed. But as soon as you realize, I don't have a clue what's going on here, you can start learning. And the Lord began to work in my heart and he showed me, Sam, I called you into missions, but you have almost none of the practical education that you need. Therefore, what I said is, all right, Lord, if I don't know what I'm doing, please give me somewhere to learn and I will go. And the Lord is such a wonderful God and did such a wonderful thing because I had asked that. And like the next day, my mom was part of our missions council. She was corresponding with one of our missionaries who had done a blog post asking for an intern. He was looking for a sidekick, for someone to get training and learning. I mean, this was like the next day that God did this. And I sat down and I said, all right, well, I'll apply and see what happens. I wasn't expecting much. But it's amazing how many jobs you can get when you're the only person who applies. <laughs> and I got to go work with Brother Travis Snow, who was a great missionary uh, in Northern Ireland. And he let me be his sidekick. As time went on, I became his uh, assistant pastor, basically. So I was able to start a children's ministry. We were able to, he let me lead singing. I worked in camps. I did all of these things, basically just being his sidekick. And then for the last year I was there, he allowed me to pastor the church in Northern Ireland that now is still going strong. The Lord has worked there. Well, he was going on furlough, so he let me kind of take the reins. And like I said, God gives us more than we could ever possibly ask for. And it's a wonderful privilege to be able to work there and minister there. And the Lord just worked in my heart about the people of the United Kingdom. See, I got there, and if you don't know this, the United Kingdom has a massive Christian history. Like, to such an extent that this, the Bible that we hold in our hands, was translated and authorized in England. 
many of our books, many of our theologians, many of the preachers that we hold up as high and holy and great, and many of our Christian songs even, these came from this place. But if you were there today, you wouldn't know. If you were there today, you would see a group of people who are, uh, statistics say, 53% non-religious. Basically, that translates to they're either atheist or they don't have enough time to even worry about God. Then you'd have a larger growing population of Hindus and a growing population of Muslims. And the Christianity that is there is a Christianity primarily built on good works and primarily built on what you can do for God. And maybe he'll show you faith, which is a sad and awful way to live. Because it's not of our works, but it's the gift of God. Not of anything that we could do, but everything that he has done for us. And so the Lord, I, so I was sitting there and I sat down and I said, what in the world happened to these people? What happened to this place? Why isn't the word of God heard here as much as it should be? And I think we have a picture of what, the, what their country looks like in the Old Testament. In Ezekiel chapter 22 and verse 30, it says this. And I sought for a man among them that should make up the hedge and stand in the gap before me for the land. That I should not destroy it. But I found none. Take a moment and understand the gravity of this verse. See, because this is God looking at his chosen people. This is Israel, who Abraham, the friend of God, was their father. Moses, who spoke to God as a friend, gave them the law. Prophet and priest and king have brought to them the word for years and years and years and years. And they, yet now God looks for one person to tell the truth, one person to preach. And what does he find? Silence. No one to share the truth. Unfortunately, this is the way it looks in much of the United Kingdom. A place where the gospel has gone forth, a place where they used to send missionaries, a place where they used to be the powerhouse for the gospel, is now dark, is now quiet, and you can't hear the word of God preached. But I find hope in this verse. I know it sounds very desolate, but he says something. He says, and I sought for a man. God is looking for men to stand up and share the truth. He's looking for them here. And he's looking for them there. And by God's grace, I want to be one of those men taking the gospel of Jesus Christ to these folks because this alone is going to be what saves them. It's not going to be social reform. It's not going to be economic reform. It's not going to be political reform. Back before the coronavirus became everybody's thought all the time, Brexit was the big deal in the UK. Do you know how much the spiritual life of people in the UK changed when they separated from the EU? Not one bit. Because it is not this. And we know that if we take the word of God and we preach the word of God, that some folks are going to get saved. And if they get saved, they need exactly what you have here. A good, local, Bible-believing Baptist church. So we're going there not just to reach people, but to plant churches. And we want to see a multitude of churches planted all over the place. For the first year, we're actually going to be working to help the Snows plant another church there in London. And we're going to be working with them for about a year, helping them to plant a, a brand new church uh, outside of London. And then we are praying about going to the city of Birmingham at the end of that year and starting our own work and seeing a multitude of churches there. And there's two ways it's going to happen. One, we're going to have to start multiple churches. That's just the way it is. You don't start churches if you don't start churches. But secondly, we know that God is going to call men into ministry. Because wherever the word of God goes, wherever people get saved, wherever their lives get changed, men are called into ministry. And as they're called, I want to help to equip them, to train them, and to be able to send them all over the UK starting more churches. Ireland, England, Scotland, Wales, these are places that need more preachers of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And I know they're out there, we just need to see them saved and taught. And also, not, not just that, but my, my vision doesn't end there, but my dream is to see the United Kingdom once again be a missionary force, sending men all over the world to reach people with the gospel of Jesus Christ. So I ask that you pray for us. I ask first that you pray for the United Kingdom. We are in deep need of help. And God told us if we have, uh, when we have a field that is ripe unto harvest, well, we need to pray for laborers in that field. And I ask that you pray with us for laborers, that God would give us more help. And if you think you might want to come to the United Kingdom, here's a wonderful help to you. No language school. There's a language barrier, but it's English, so you'll be all right. I mean, if I got past it, I'm a redneck from picking South Carolina. If I got past it in Ireland, y'all will be fine in England. But we need help. Finally, I, I, secondly, I ask that you pray for us. God has blessed us with uh, somewhere around 65 to 67% of our support. 
just heard of a new supporter yesterday. The Lord has really blessed and done amazing things for us. And we were, have our tickets bought for September. But I'm not entirely sure that that's going to work as far as us to leave them unless God does a miracle. If you'll pray that God will, that'd be wonderful. But right now, we're looking, because the coronavirus set us back by about two months, and we have bought tickets in January, we're looking at maybe moving those back to November. So please uh, pray that God would give us direction, give us what we need to be able to get there. Two things you can pray there. Support, of course. But secondly, that you would pray that the visas and airline situation, everything like that, would stay the same or better. Because right now, at least the country is open, visas are going, and everything's all right. And finally, I ask that you would pray. Uh, one thing that about deputation that I had not realized until I got on it is how much the churches, the Church of God blesses people. You church has already been a blessing to me, and even in, in letting me, uh, giving me somewhere to stay last night and having a um, the church service this morning. But in turn, I know this is a time of ministry for me. So I ask you to pray that as y'all are a blessing to me, that I would be a blessing to the churches that we go to. And to y'all, my time would not be spent just in going around with my hand out, but it would be spent out as well in doing ministry for the Lord. Now, if y'all will pray for us that way, I'd really appreciate it. Give one of our prayer cards. Uh, these are almost brand new. If you will pray for this beautiful lady here and these two really cute kids that I'm sorry you didn't get to meet, I know I will catch some of the residual. So thank you very much. Thank you for sure. We're so thankful for each of you being with us today. We thank God for the liberty and freedom we have in this country. Someone had to pay the price. Someone had to stand up and say, we want liberty, we want freedom. And they, they took the test. We're in 2 Peter chapter 2. Uh, excuse me, chapter 1. 2 Peter chapter 1. And what we'll do today is just read the whole chapter and just point out a few things. And look, this is Some people just come for the singing of the Fowler Avenue Baptist Church. We got such such singing that blesses people's heart and blesses their soul. A lot of people can't come, and we understand that. They need to stay home because of the, the immune system of their body or their age. And they're there, they can't come, they can't get out. They'd like to be here. But we're thankful that you're able to come and be with us. You need to pray for those that can't be here. And then go to Second Peter chapter one. I want to read something here from this Bible here. And uh, we like all different kind of Bibles with information that will challenge and encourage God's people. And this is what is called a, an application study Bible. Have you ever heard of that? Tremendous Bible. And he has some very interesting comments in starting of 2 Peter uh, chapter 1. And I'm going to read the introduction here. It kind of sounds like what our brother going to the UK was. Uh, these people had been informed. They had been told. But something about lethargy, laziness, and laxness, something, they did. This, this, this second Peter's uh, a word of warning to God's children. And I want to just give the information here that I read concerning him. Second Peter is a letter of warning from an authority, none other than the courageous, experienced, and faithful apostle. It is the last communication from this great warrior of Christ. Soon thereafter, he would die, martyred for the faith that he stood for. Previously, Peter had written to comfort and encourage believers in the midst of a suffering and persecution, an external onslaught. But three years later, this is when this was written. In this epistle containing this written message, he wrote to warn them of an internal attack, internal attack, complacency, heresy. He speaks of holding fast to the non-negotiable facts of your faith, of growing and maturing in the faith, and rejecting all who would twist the truth. If his readers heeded Peter's warning, their lives would be honoring to Christ and their churches would be Christ-centered. After a brief greeting in 1 Peter chapter 1, Peter gives the antidote of the strategy and short sightedness in the Christians. He explains that the days, their days are numbered. His days was numbered. And that the believers should listen to the message and the words of the scripture. Let's go to 2 Peter chapter 1 in your Bible. When we get into these verses, 
and just lift out a few verses or words that we might be emphasize things on. But in 2 Peter chapter 1, that's where we're starting. Simon Peter, a servant and apostle of Jesus Christ, to them that have obtained like precious faith with us through the righteousness of God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. God's righteousness has been put to their account because they're placed their faith in God's Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And the righteousness that Christ came to give us was imputed to us. We give Him our sins, He gives us His righteousness. And we thank God for that. Verse 2, grace and peace. Tremendous words. Grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge. That word knowledge is found in verse 2. It's found in verse uh, verse 3. It's found in uh, verse 5. It's found in verse 8. And so when you take a word knowledge, what is knowledge? I look that word up. Knowledge. Facts. And skills acquired by a person through experience. We get knowledge from different things through experiences of life. And then education being taught. And God says that when he would arise, he would send us a comforter. He would send us the Holy Spirit. And he came and the Holy Spirit of God is our teacher. He's the one that instructs us. He teaches us. He guides us. He guards us. He graces us. And so we have with us, as children of God, the one who gave us the scriptures. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. The triune God is working out in the lives of God's people to encourage them to stay on track. Notice what he says here. He says this, according as his divine power hath given to us all things that pertain unto life and godliness through the knowledge of him that hath called us to glory and virtue. We are God's chosen people. We're God's gifted people. We are the people of God. Can you imagine that? We're laborers together with God. We're workers together with him. We are his witnesses, warriors, his workers, his worshipers. And God wants us to keep on serving him. Even when the enemy comes in and those inside, we get, we get careless, we get lax, we get lazy, we get indolent. We fail, we fall, or we fumble. And God says that he knows that. He wants to lift you up when you do falter, when you do fumble, when you do fail. Don't stay down. By the grace of God, get up and keep going for Jesus. Keep serving him. We look at this in verse uh, 4. Whereby are given to us exceeding great and precious promises that by these you might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world. Look at what he says now. Verse 3. According as his divine nature has given to us, all things pertaining to life and God through the knowledge of him that have called us to glory and virtue, whereby are given to us exceeding great and precious promises, partakes of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust, and besides this, giving all diligence, add to your faith. You're to add to your faith. Your faith will lie dormant. Where does faith come from? Faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. So our faith needs to grow. It needs to develop. We need to become mature. And it will not, it cannot, unless we get into the word of God, and the word of God gets into us. And we begin not only to be hearers of the word, but begin to be doers of the word. Notice what he says here in verse 5. And besides this, give all diligence to add to your faith virtue. And what is virtue? Virtue is goodness, right action, and right thinking. It's uh, morality, virtue. Add to your faith virtue. 
Where do you get this from? It's from the Word of God and the God's working in our life through and by the Holy Spirit and through His Word. There's, there's no goodness in us. The only goodness we have is God giving us that. What goodness we have is all of God and the work of the Holy Spirit of God. He says, I don't add to you, your faith virtue, but he says something else here. Notice what he says. Add to your faith virtue and the virtue knowledge. What is knowledge? Knowledge is a learning process. God says he would not have you to be ignorant, brethren. In other words, he wants you to be informed. He wants you to be taught. He wants you to be instructed through the teaching of God's word by the Holy Spirit of God. Knowledge. Knowing things through personal experience and through the process and the progress that God uses to help us to learn things. Knowledge. And he goes on to say this. Virtue and the knowledge temperance. What is temperance? Care in keeping one's actions, his appetites, his feelings under control. All of us have two natures now. One nature is the nature of Christ and God in us. The other nature is the Adamic nature. It has not been eradicated yet. It will be one day. But right now, we have this struggle. Every day, there's a fight, there's a battle going on. And every child of God, the choices we make, and God lets you make those choices. You're not a robot. God wants to instruct you, He wants to teach you, then He wants to act upon God's Word. He says here, add to your faith virtue and the virtue to knowledge and knowledge temperance and to patience. What is patience? It's the ability to become, keep on even through your God, pain and suffering and difficulty like some of you are experiencing right now or will experience. <laughs> Your patience is endurance. It's keeping on, keeping on. Serving your Lord. No matter what. Staying calm. Not complaining. Not belly aching. And saying, God, I don't like what you've allowed to be on my plate. I wish it wasn't here, but it's my turn for it to be here. Now give me grace. Give me grit. Give me guts. Give me strength, God, to keep on serving you no matter what I face. I don't know what you're facing right now. I know some have lost their jobs. Some people don't want to know where their next payment's going to come from their, to pay their rent. And things are troubled. You know, trouble, tribulation, trials, and testing, they're going to be your portion. But God says, keep on keeping on no matter what you face. Keep your eyes on Jesus. Amen. He says, add to your faith, virtue, knowledge, temperance, patience, and Godliness, godliness, and godliness, brotherly kindness. Be kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another even as God, for Christ's sake, has forgiven you. Though maybe someone has hurt your feelings, and maybe did something to you, they, they wish it wasn't there, but it is there. And God says, be kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another even as God has forgiven you. That's where you get the calmness, the reassurance. Will to forgive. And brotherly kindness, love. Men shall know that you're my disciples if you have love one toward another. Love. He goes on to say this. For if these things be in you, these things we just mentioned, if these things be in you and abound, these things be in you and abound, they make you that you shall neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. More learning, more understanding as you open yourself up and say, God, I want to learn. I want, I want, to, I want to be a vessel, not put on a shelf or sidetrack. I want to be used of God while I can. Some people have that attitude. You're 60 or 70 and say, well, I've done my part. Your part is not finished until you're dead. You keep serving Jesus no matter how old you might be. There's always something you can do, something you can get involved in, in serving your Savior. And when He finally decides to take you home, then it'll be done. Serving with all you have and with all you've got. Adding to your faith, growing, developing, maturing, all these things. Go to verse 9. 
But he that lacks these things, if these things are lacking in your life, look what happens. If these things, if, 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 if but if these things lack, he is blind. He cannot see afar off. He's nearsighted. Hath forgotten that he once purged from his old sins. There's some people even doubt their salvation. Why? Because they're not growing. They're not developing. They're not using the resources that God has made available for us to be an overcomer, to be victorious, more than conquerors through him that loved us. God wants you to be victorious. God wants you to be, want to have victory in your life. Not going around discouraged, defeated, depressed, throwing in the towel. Don't faint. He's given us this mystery. We are, we are his custodians. We're his caretakers. And God wants us to be good caretakers. Stewards of the manifold grace of God. A caretaker. So what else? This time that we have is God's time. The breath that you breathe, God has given you. Everything we have. God has given us all things to enjoy. And be a blessing to us that we might bless others. Yeah. Keep on looking at it. But if, he, if these things are not in you, that's what happened to that great country whereby we got the word of God and so many great men of God. They've gotten away from the word of God and the, the things of God. they become lax. they become lazy. lazy. they become backslidden. And pretty soon they become worldly and carnal. Not being used of God. Same things he's saying here. It's happened in America. Even in our churches. May God help us to get up and not stay down and keep serving Jesus no matter what comes our way. Now what he says in verse 10. Wherefore, the rather brethren, give diligence to make your calling and election sure. Your calling and election. Election means your choice. Your cho what you're, you're choosing. Make sure of your faith. Make sure of your salvation. I think I'm saved. I hope I'm saved. No, these are written that you might know that you're saved. And you're in the keeping hand of Almighty God. You're kept by the power of God. There's no, no power equal to Him. If these things, if you do these things, you shall never fall. Fall, fail, falter, fumble around. That's where we find ourselves many times. But get up from that place of discouragement and defeat. Back, backsliding and sinning. Get back on track with God. You see, these are overlapping things because all these letters that God allowed Paul to write in different ones, they overlap. They keep repeating themselves. And you're going to find, he says, these things, I, I won't put you in remembrance of them. Why? Because we forget. We forget. And you're going to find this as we keep reading. Notice what he says here. For so is an entrance shall be ministered unto you abundantly into everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Verse 12. Wherefore I will not be, I will not, I will be not be negligent to put you all away in remembrance of these things. You know them already. You, you've been established in the truth of God. But somehow you've gotten away from God. What he says. Wherefore I will not be next to put, all, put you always in remembrance. Remembrance is found three times. Remember, remember, remember. Why? Because we get flax. We get lazy. We, get, we forget what God has done in life. What God wants us to do for him. We forget. Wherefore I will not be negative to put you always in for these things. Though you know them. And be established in the present truth. I know you've heard it before. But you need to hear it again. That the Spirit of God may energize you. May convict you. May stir you. He's going to find, My wife says you're always stirring up stuff. He says. I'm going to make. I might bring these things to your mouth. I might stir you up. Stir you up. From your license you're lazy. Stir you up. You find this right here. Same thing in the UK. Verse 13, yeah, I think it'd be as long as I'm in this, in, this, in, in this tabernacle to stir you up, putting you in what? Remembrance. You've said that before, preacher. You preach that message. And he says, I will thou confirm these constantly. And he that has been saved and called in the work of God, keep it before them. Keep it before them. And the Spirit of God might bring conviction and concern and stir them. Stir them up. I don't like to be stirred up. We need to be stirred up. That's what I put you in, in remembering that somehow you might be stirred up from our laxness and our condition we find ourselves in that we should not be there. He goes on to say this. 
knowing that shortly I must put all of my, he said, I don't want to, I've just only got a few, few I just got a little time with you. This is his last, last communication with them we find. This is, these are his last words of warning and, and challenge and encouragement. I know where you are, I know where you are tomorrow. Whatever comes on your plate may, may, may cause you to get away from God. Uh, every time I try to serve God, things go bad. Uh, my wife trying to get ready today. The dog's got it problems. And then her glasses break right through here. I says, honey, just put them together and let's go. We're almost late. He says, you ever had the devil on your back? <laughs> He's right there trying to, to discourage and defeat you. Trying to get you down. God says, I want to stir you up that you might get up and keep going for God. Knowing that shortly I must put off this time tabernacle, even as our Lord Jesus Christ has showed me. Over I will endeavor that you may be able after my decease to have these things always in remembrance. I've given these that you'll always have them there to remember who you are and what you are and what God wants out of your life. Verse 16. For we have not followed cunning devised fables when we made known unto you the power and the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. But were eyewitnesses of this majesty. Verse 17. For he received from God the Father honor and glory when there came such a voice from heaven, the excellent glory. This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. When Peter saw these things and different ones, let's build a tabernacle of Moses. God says, boom! You keep your eyes on Jesus. Not the preacher, not the program. Keep your eyes on Jesus. He's the one. This is my beloved son, whom I am well pleased. Verse 18. And this voice which I came from heaven, we heard when we were with him in the holy mount. We have also a more sure word of prophecy. Wherefore we do we do you all well that you take heed as unto a light that shineth in a dark place until the day dawn and the day star arise in your heart. Verse 20 and 21, we close this. Knowing this first. First things first knowing this first that no prophecy of the scripture is of any private interpretation for the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Spirit the Holy Spirit of God is used by God to give us the word of God all scripture is given by us praise God is profitable for, for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, and right, that the man of God, the woman of God, may be thoroughly finished unto all good works. These things affirm constantly. Don't forget it. Keep it before them by way of remembrance. By way of remembrance. By way of remembrance. We forget. Folks, we're so glad that you came today. Your greatest thing you want to do to be we leave, make sure that you're saved. If there's a doubt, there's a question, Settle it. Drive that stake down today. Say, Lord Jesus, I believe you came from heaven. You died on that cross. You shed your blood. It's the blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, cleanses from all sin. They put him in the tomb. But on the third day, he rose. That's where our victory is. Our victory is in Christ. Not in religion. Not in baptism. But in Jesus Christ, our Savior. Aren't you glad of that? He paid the price. He wants you with what you've got. Not to lay down, not to quit, not to stop, not to fail, not to falter, not to fumble. Just get, if you do, and we do, get up by the grace of God and keep serving Jesus. Amen. Steve, come on up, if you will. Let's bow together in prayer. You're saved today. You're hurting because God knows you're hurt. He knows your anxiety. He knows your frustration. He knows your fears. He knows all about you. He wants to lift you up. He wants to encourage you today. To strengthen you that you might be what he's called you to do. His laborer, his, his warrior, his worker. God says, you're my labor. Your labor is together with God. Your worker is together with me. Don't let, let Satan and the world pull you down. Help us, Father, to keep serving you no matter what. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.